Hello, uh, my name is Joan Feigenbaum. I am an Amazon scholar in the AWS Cryptographic Algorithms Group. My academic affiliation is with Yale University, where I am the Grace Murray Hopper Professor of Computer Science. So today I'm going to talk about privacy-preserving machine learning. I'll start with a motivating example and an overall vision for how the members of my group and I want to solve this kind of problem. I'll then go into the core of our technical approach, which revolves around computing with encrypted data. I'll say a few words about two privacy-preserving machine learning prototypes that we've built in my group, one of which has to do with training machine learning models, and the other one of which has to do with using these models to do prediction. And then I'll summarize and tell you some of our ongoing projects and our plans for the short and medium term future. So consider this scenario. Uh, there are three parties. The first is a medical data analysis company that offers disease predictions to customers. The customers send their medical records and then the analysis company makes disease predictions based on those records. So it, of course, wants to use state-of-the-art models to do this predicting, both models that it has devised and also possibly models that other companies have devised and that it could buy access to. But it has to take care, of course, to protect its customers' privacy. The second party is a machine learning company that has developed a state-of-the-art proprietary disease prediction model. And it has trained this model on data sets that were compiled at teaching hospitals and possibly other kinds of medical research institutions. So it wants to sell access to its state-of-the-art model on a pay-per-prediction basis. But of course, it has to protect its IP. It can't just ship its model to some other company because this is a very valuable piece of IP. Okay, and the third party is a teaching hospital which develops new treatments and new diagnosis procedures. And in the process of doing so, it compiles very valuable patient data sets. It has a lot of data about which patients developed the disease and which didn't. And it has the medical records to go along with that. So it wants, of course, to make this, these data sets available. It's a research institution, after all. It wants to make them available in particular to companies that develop disease prediction models. But it has to preserve its patients' privacy. All right. So to serve the organizations in this and many similar scenarios, my colleagues and I envision a cloud-based service that we call a privacy-preserving machine learning marketplace. Owners of proprietary models, owners of sensitive training data sets, and individuals who want to submit queries and obtain predictions can come to the marketplace and use cloud computation to solve their ML training and their ML prediction problems. Importantly, they can do so while protecting their sensitive data and their valuable IP, because all of the cloud computation will be done on encrypted data. For example, in this diagram, model owner B can supply an encrypted model. Model user E can supply an encrypted query. Upon completion of the computation that's taking place on behalf of both of these parties, the, the service returns an encrypted prediction to user E, who decrypts it on the client side. So no one except B and E, in fact, not even the cloud provider itself, is ever exposed to the plain text model, the plain text query, or the plain text result. So that's our vision. And I'd like to say a few words now about our technical approach, which involves computing on encrypted data. 
So the technical term of art for computing on encrypted data is homomorphic encryption. So a fully homomorphic encryption scheme supports addition and multiplication on ciphertexts. The first fully homomorphic encryption scheme was devised by Craig Gentry in 2009. This was a huge breakthrough. Uh, Gentry was then a PhD student at Stanford. So a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, or an FHE scheme, allows us to take two plain texts, say M1 and M2, and encrypt them to create two ciphertexts, say C1 and C2. Now, what we can then do is over in the ciphertext space, add C1 and C2 to get another ciphertext, which we'll call C prime. So throughout this talk, whenever I have a orange uh, operation, like that orange plus or the orange times, those are computations that are taking place on ciphertexts. The white or other color computations are taking place on plain text. Okay, so we encrypted M1 and M2, we added the results in the ciphertext space, and we got C prime. Now, this is a homomorphic encryption scheme in the sense that had we added M1 and M2 in the plain text space and then encrypted, we would also have gotten to C prime. Okay, so we can either encrypt and then add, or add and then encrypt. And either way, we wind up with the same ciphertext. And everything I just said about addition goes for multiplication as well. Okay, now together, those two facts are immensely powerful. Because as you probably recall, if you ever took a circuit design course, if you were an EE major, or you took a computability theory course, if you were a CS major, addition and multiplication are a complete set of operations. For any function we might want to compute, we can build an arithmetic circuit to compute that function. And the circuit will consist of only addition and multiplication gates. So what does that mean for homomorphic encryption? Well, it means that for any function f that we might want to compute on any data set x, we could just compute f of x directly. That gives us y. And that's what's written over there on the right in the brackets. Alternatively, we could apply a fully homomorphic encryption scheme to x, take the ciphertext, and pump it through an arithmetic circuit for f, that's the orange f there, get the result out, apply homomorphic decryption, and also get y. Okay? We can either compute and then encrypt, or encrypt and then compute. Either way, we wind up with the same encrypted result, and then we decrypt it. And this works fully generally for any function f, okay? Now, as you might imagine, uh, using fully homomorphic encryption um, and doing operations on ciphertext imposes a performance penalty, and FHE is not yet fast enough to be used in all applications on all f's. There's work going on, it's getting faster all the time, but it's not quite fast enough for all scenarios yet. However, there are faster SHE, S stands for somewhat. There are faster somewhat homomorphic encryption schemes that work not on every F, but on some F that are useful in privacy-preserving machine learning. And I'm going to present a privacy-preserving machine learning application later in which we used an SHE scheme. All right, so before I go on with my privacy-preserving machine learning story, I just would like to impress upon you that the existence of fully homomorphic encryption schemes is, has potentially very profound implications for the cloud computing business. In principle, if we deployed fully homomorphic encryption, then any customer of AWS could, on the client side, generate a key, K, 
take whatever data set he wants to use for his computation and encrypt it using this fully homomorphic encryption key kit. That gives him an encrypted data set, which is depicted by X in the rectangle. Okay, so then he, this customer sends to the cloud his encrypted data set and a description of the function F that he wants to compute on this data set. Over on the server side, the cloud computation service could evaluate an arithmetic circuit for F on the encrypted data. That gives him an encrypted result. So that's F of X with the rectangle around it. The cloud service sends the encrypted result back to the customer and the customer decrypts it on the client side. So the customer never has to reveal his encryption keys or his plain text data, even to the cloud service that he is employing to do the computation. So this has profound implications for the cloud business because although, you know, obviously cloud computing is very popular, there are some very large customers that use the cloud extensively, but they don't use it for everything. They don't use it for some of their most super sensitive computations. Because the way things work now, you know, anyone can store encrypted data in the cloud. But in order to do some kind of sophisticated computation on that data, the data have to be decrypted. So this would eliminate that. Anyone who was worried about revealing super sensitive data to a cloud provider or who was under contractual obligation not to do so. Okay, sometimes a customer's concern is not that he doesn't want to reveal his own data, but he has his own customer's data that he's contractually obligated not to reveal to a third party. Homomorphic encryption, if fully deployed, could completely eliminate those concerns. Any computation could be done in the cloud on encrypted data and no one but the customer on his client side would ever be exposed to the plain text. Okay, so back to privacy preserving machine learning. I'd now like to tell you about two uh, privacy preserving machine learning prototypes that we've built in my group. The first has to do with logistic regression on encrypted training data sets. And this uh, prototype was built by my colleague, Eric Crockett. So, for those of you who haven't heard about it, in statistics, a logistic model is used to model the probability of a certain event happening or not happening. So if you have a model, you feed an instance into it and you get out something like pass, fail, win, lose, or getting back to the medical data analysis example that we used at the beginning, um, you get out this patient, Whose, whose medical record this is, is likely to contract the disease in question or is not likely to contract it. All right, so the training process starts with a set of labeled instances. So again, in the medical data example, you would have a set of patient records, and these would be the records of real human beings, some of which had actually contracted the disease in question. So those would be labeled one and others of which had not contracted the disease in question, and those would be labeled zero. All right, so the training algorithm uh, analyzes those data and comes up with a model. So in this case, a model is a function, and that function subsequently will be used to predict one or zero on as yet unlabeled instances. So you would put, say, the medical record of a patient into this function and you would get out a one or a zero, depending upon whether this model thinks that this patient is likely to get the disease or not. So by the time we got to this problem, there had been previous work on it. And um, other research teams had used fully homomorphic encryption, a la Gentry, to encrypt training data sets. And they had used arithmetic circuits 
to produce encrypted models of the required form. So our goal was to come up with arithmetic circuits that are more efficient. So they also take fully homomorphic, fully homomorphically encrypted training data and output a function, an encrypted function, but we want to be able to do this more efficiently so that we can run this training algorithm on larger, richer training data sets. So some of you who know how logistic regression works might be wondering, how do you use an arithmetic circuit to perform logistic regression training? If you don't know anything about logistic regression, just ignore the first bullet on this slide. So the most common method for logistic regression training, um, the key operation is approximating a sigmoid function. That's a function of the form sigma of x equals 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x. So you might be wondering, how can you use an arithmetic circuit to evaluate a sigmoid function? Well, in fact, there are very good polynomial approximations to sigmoid functions. So here we have a, uh, on the slide, a degree three polynomial. In general, there are fairly low degree polynomials that give you very close approximations of sigmoid functions. And polynomials are just about the ideal thing to evaluate using arithmetic circuits. So that's what's going on here. All right, back to Crockett's results. So what we mean by a more efficient circuit in this context is a circuit with lower multiplicative depth. The multiplicative depth of an arithmetic circuit is the largest number of sequential multiplications that would have to be done from when you put the input into the circuit and when you get the output out, okay? So the longest chain of sequential multiplications from input to output, okay? So that's a very good proxy for the total running time of an arithmetic circuit. And as you can see over here in the leftmost column of this chart, Crockett's a uh, method produces circuits that have approximately half, or exactly half in this chart, approximately half of the multiplicative depth of the previously best known. Okay, so not only are they faster in that they have lower multiplicative depth, they also are produced more quickly. If you look at the rightmost column in this chart, you'll see that the training time of Crockett's method is significantly lower than the training time of the previous best known method. Now there is a trade-off as shown in the middle two columns in this chart. With Crockett's circuits, the total number of multiplications that, is do that are done over the course of a training run is larger than it is in the previous best known method, but that doesn't matter because first of all, it's small enough to be tractable. And second of all, multiplication operations that are, do not add to the multiplicative depth can be done in parallel. So very efficient. Okay, so um, the last thing I'd just like to say about this prototype is the use case that motivated it involved a non-standard threat model. What I showed you in my slide about generic deployment of homomorphic encryption and its implications for the cloud business in that setting, the motivation of someone using homomorphic encryption was to be able to perform a cloud computation without having to reveal data to the cloud provider. In the use case that motivated this logistic uh, regression training exercise, that wasn't the threat. The user was worried instead about potential compromise of his data scientist's machines. Um, he, what, the way he does business now is he stores a big data lake in AWS and data scientists uh, periodically go and extract a sample from the data lake and use it to train models. So the worry of this user was that if a hacker, if a bad guy somehow infects the machine of one of his data scientists, then when the data scientist thinks that the machine is extracting a sample and constructing a model, 
what it could instead be doing is exfiltrating the data lake. So, of course, if the data lake is stored in homomorphically encrypted form and the sample that is extracted and used to build a model is encrypted, then it doesn't matter if the hacker exfiltrates data. The hacker doesn't have the decryption key and can't do anything with that data. So that's a very interesting threat model that I had never heard of before. Okay, so on to our second prototype. Uh, here, we are not interested in training models, but rather in using models on encrypted queries. Um, so the kind of models we're interested in is extreme gradient boosting or XGBoost models. And this project was led by my colleague, Jinri Meng, and I worked on it with him. So a model in an XGBoost setting is a set of classification and regression trees, or CARTs. So CARTs are similar to decision trees in that, except they don't, they don't output one or zero. Instead, they output a numerical score, okay? So the prediction algorithm for XGBoost takes an input, runs it through each of the CARTs, gets a numerical score out of each of the CARTs, and then aggregates all of these scores somehow and returns one aggregated score. So usually aggregation is done with sum or with the soft max operation. Uh, in our setting, it was done with sum. All right, so just to give you a better feel for how this works, I have a toy example here. In this model, there are two carts and each instance describes a human being um, with two features age and height, all right? So if we had a query in which age was 36 and height was 175 centimeters, the first cart in this model would compare 36 with the value 40, which is the comparison value in the internal node. And it would take the left branch because 36 is less than 40 and it would output two. The other cart would take the height 175 centimeters, it would compare it with 180 centimeters, it would take the left branch because 175 is less than 180, and it would output 0.7. Uh, the XGBoost prediction algorithm would aggregate by summing 2 and 0.7, and it would output 2.7. Okay, so we created a privacy-preserving version of XGBoost that we call PPXGBoost. Um, so I don't have time to describe exactly how this uh, prediction algorithm works, but I'll, sh I'll tell you some of its novel features. So in our application, we would have one model and many users, and um, the uh, application creates a personalized encrypted model for every user. So if we look back at the previous slide here, it would encrypt these values in the internal nodes, the values that are used for comparison, okay? So we use two interesting types of encryption functions. One of them is called order-preserving encryption. And order-preserving encryption is sort of what it sounds like. If you have two plain texts, X and Y, where X is less than Y, then for any encryption key K, if you encrypt both X and Y with the same key K. You get out a ciphertext for X that is less than the ciphertext for Y. So you map plain texts to ciphertexts and preserve the less than relationship. Okay, so you can see why that would be very useful in evaluating XGBoost models because you could do comparison and come up with the right value for whether this ciphertext is less than that ciphertext, but not have to decrypt them. Okay. The other thing we used is a somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme. So not fully general like Gentry's scheme, but faster. A somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme that just works for addition. So if you take two, two ciphertexts and add them and then decrypt, you get the, the uh, decryption of the sum of the plain text. Okay, so you can see why that would be useful in XGBoost because we can take encrypted outputs 
like 2 and 0.7, except the ciphertext of 2 and the ciphertext of 0.7, add them, send them back to the client, and then the client can decrypt them. Okay, that's why we need an additive encryption scheme. The word asymmetric here means that this happens to be a public key additive homomorphic encryption scheme. All right, so we tested PPXG Boost on three different data sets, one of which is an Amazon internal data set, the other two of which are public, publicly available data and often used for this type of test. We found in our experiments that using privacy preserving XG Boost as opposed to just XG Boost could cost you up to a factor of a thousand in running time and it could cost you up to a factor of about 10 in model size. Now you might think, oh, that's a showstopper, but in fact it's not. Because as you can see in the second to the left column in this chart, the total absolute running time of a query in PPXG Boost is still less than half a second. And that's plenty good for many real world scenarios. So for example, in the medical data analysis scenario that we used in our motivating slide, slide um, the uh, patients that send medical data records to the data analysis company don't need an answer right away. Taking a half a second to do a query on encrypted data in that scenario would be just fine. Okay, and same thing for the model size. This is plenty good enough for many real world applications. Okay, so to summarize, I've presented a vision of a cloud-based privacy-preserving ML marketplace. Um, I have shown you uh, two promising prototypes, one on logistic regression training and the other on XGBoost prediction. So in the short term, we're still improving these prototypes. We plan to release them on the AWS Labs website for public use. And we are also studying the application of homomorphic encryption in various other uh, practical scenarios, including federated learning, advertising metrics, and fraud detection. Thank you for your attention. If you'd like to learn anything more about this stuff, please feel free to contact me by email. I'd also like to thank Matt Campagna, who's the head of my group, and my colleagues, uh, Eric uh, uh, Crockett, Jean-Ri Meng, and Alex Weibel. And finally, we'd be very appreciative if you would complete the session survey. Thank you.